as we often do, would you please kneel with me as we talk to the Lord. Oh God, our cry and our plea is that you would speak to us today. Feed us with the food of your word. And may we not leave here hungry but filled. Knowing that as the world eats away at us, Lord, we will need to be filled again. And so daily may we have time that we spend with you in our war rooms. That precious time where we seek your face through prayer and Bible study. God, may we learn to love your word, yes, but also love the God of the word. Fill this place today with your spirit. Many have come saddened, others broken. And some not knowing what to expect. But each one needing the same thing, the healing power of the gospel in their lives. Move us to the throne today. May we see Jesus high and lifted up. In His name we pray, amen. As we continue our study in James, basic training for growing Christians, would you take your copy of God's Word and let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12 today. Presently in our culture, there are about 45 million people or 14% of the U.S. population who live at poverty levels. Now, understand the way that we define poverty in the U.S. is completely different than how poverty is defined worldwide. In fact, many poor people in our nation would be deemed millionaires and very wealthy people in other nations of the world. But conversely speaking, to that 14%, about 3.5 million people are deemed wealthy. And so there are the vast majority of Americans who are still considered the middle class. But nevertheless, James looks at the rich and the poor because both of these classes existed in his world. They really didn't have what we know as today a middle class. There were just two classes. And you see in James' day, they looked at the richest people who were blessed by God and God had favor upon their life. That is why they were rich and the people in the first century church, they must have been poor simply because they had done something to bring about God's judgment upon their life. Now, while you and I may know that to be not true, James agreed. But it's interesting that in our own culture, that so often we look at people who are poor downtroddenly. We simply look at them as if they're poor and say, well, you know, you're poor because you're refusing to work. And that's why you're poor. And those who may be wealthy are better off, but yet live terrible lives morally and spiritually. In America, we tend to lift them up and look up to these individuals. Well, James addresses these misconceptions because he looks at both groups of people and he says whether you're rich or whether you're poor, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the same thing and that's Jesus Christ. And he is your all in all. Would you stand this morning as we honor the reading of God's word? Beginning in verse 1, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 1. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And before you're seated, let me share this. Have you ever thought about the crown of righteousness? It's a beautiful picture for a Christian. 
Because Gabriel himself does not wear your crown or my crown. For all the crowns that are given to the followers and the people of God, there is only one crown that fits the child of God, being it you or me, that fits our head. And it's the crown that is shaped and formed by Jesus himself. What a great word of encouragement and challenge to us today. May God honor the reading of his word. You may be seated. Two points today. Poor and rich. We're not going to go into an elaborate uh, setup or anything. We're just going to go straight into the text and look at three areas in which God has called the poor to still look to Him. Three areas how God has called those who may be better off or wealthy to look to Him. Now, when we speak of the poor and we speak of the rich, today we're speaking of believers. All right? Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers in America, said many years ago, contentment makes poor men rich, but discontentment makes rich men poor. The first thing I want you to look at this morning, those who are poor, is that those who are poor are called to be humble or to have humility. There were many poor beggars in James' day. You go back all the way to Acts chapter 3, and Peter and John are working, walking on the outskirts of the temple, and a man is there on the ground begging and he says, do you have money? I need money because that's the only way that I can exist and live in this world. I love verse 6. Peter looks at him and he says, man, silver and gold, have I none? But what I have, I will give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and what? Walk. Not man, sit there in your pitiful spiritual and physical condition while I give you a few pennies. But he said, man, there's more to life than money. The greatest thing in life is having Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life to give you hope and meaning and purpose. Oh, and that man got up and the Bible says he was so excited, he followed Peter and John all the way into the temple. Man, can you imagine being in that day and have seen this man sitting in the ground in his tumultuous state and all of a sudden he's walking I imagine he was jumping up and down. God did a work in that man's life. But you know, there are some in this world who actually brag about being poor. You say, Brother Brian, I've never met anyone who brags about being poor. You need to go to the city, to large metropolitan areas. And yes, you will see people who sit on street corners and they beg. But oftentimes what happens if, is if you go by the, these individuals and you don't give them anything, they actually look down on you because you're not giving to them as if they've deserved something by sitting on the street corner. Begging, therefore, becomes an expected lifestyle wherein people are looked down upon. If they can't give, understand this today, the poor can oftentimes become depressed. This depression leads a person to resent his life. And then all of a sudden it can lead a person to become self-oriented. Whereas the only thing I'm concerned about in my life is receiving pity from other people around me. Do you know anybody like that? <clears throat> Woe is me. I didn't have a ribeye steak this week. Woe is me. Somebody help me. Friends, there are people in this world who didn't have but a handful of food to eat all week long. How blessed we are in this nation. And as Christians, God has promised to always be faithful to our needs. Listen. James says in James 4.10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and allow God to lift you up. Paul says himself in Ephesians 2.19 that if we are Christians, we are fellow citizens, we are men of God's household. It doesn't matter what we have on this earth, but it does matter who we have. Because if Jesus is Lord of all, then we have everything we need. And yet he calls us to be humble in our lives. He also calls those who are poor to trust him. 
The Bible tells us in 1 Kings 17, 12, a story about a widow and her son. It's a time of drought, and the widow goes to her cupboard and sees that there's nothing there, and she tells the prophet Elijah, we're going to eat what little we have today, and then we're going to literally give up hope and faith in life, and we will die. Well, guess what? God shows up. When people think life's not worth living, guess what oftentimes happens? God shows up. He does give us that purpose and that meaning because He breathes life into us. He says, you need food, I will give you food. Today in our country, we need peace. Guess what? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is everything we need Him to be so that we might be what God wants us to be. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding. You see, many people have relegated themselves in lives to begging, to waiting by the mail check, mailbox to receive monthly checks. They've relegated themselves to talking to other people to make them feel bad for their present circumstances. Friends, the Bible says if you can work, Work, not simply for money, but to give God glory. Do you know that work is a blessing from God? He gives us a mouth, He gives us hands, He gives us legs. I've had people say, well, Brother Brian, I can't walk. Can you sit well? Well, I sit pretty good in my recliner. I share this with a lady in my former church pastorate. She was a homebound lady, and she said, I can't come to church because the pews hurt my back. I promise you. We had a deacon's meeting, and I, I asked the lady this. I said, ma'am, can you sit in your recliner? She had yes. She said yes. I want you to know I had a deacon's meeting, and I said, guys, I'm very tempted to put two rows of recliners in this section right here. Now, you laugh, but I want you to think about this for a moment. If a person says that what is hindering them from worship is the physical place of seating, physical place where they sit, what does that really say about the church? Well, we want those who are able to come and those who are not able to come, you stay away. Now, I decided not to do that because I was afraid we would not have senior adults or invalid type people here, but more or less people who could do things and they'd all put out remotes with mute buttons. And I didn't think that would be good. But the point is this. If God has given you the opportunity to glorify Him with your life, do so. Do so. Trust God that He will provide. You may be in a circumstance and situation where you say, Lord, I physically cannot work and you know my heart, you know my needs. Well, the Bible says then that we trust God for as many outlets as, possibly, as we possibly can. Sometimes that may include moving. That may include leaving a certain area. Are you willing to do that in order for God to provide for your life? If the answer is no, then you have told God the level to which He can provide for you. God, you can only work in my life in this little box. And if you don't work here, well, then you don't love me, you don't care for me, and I'm not going to trust you. Friend, you know what Abram did? He called Abram and he said, Abram, I want you to go to a land that you don't know about yet, but I'm going to show you where you need to go. Well, Abram heard the voice of many gods he had worshipped many gods, but the one voice of this one God, Yahweh, shows up. And the only one that stood out to Abram was his voice. And he said, yes, God, where you want me to go, I will go. The Bible says in Genesis 12 that God promised to bless Abram and to bless his people, that they would be a great nation, that his seed would always continue. And what a great thing to know that the Son of God would come through that line as well. A line of faithfulness. God calls us to trust Him. And He also calls those who are poor to obey Him. God's not concerned with our financial means. But he's concerned with our spiritual hearts. And if we're Christians, our heart is not to come before God with all that we have. But what we come before God with is who we have. We bring before Him the best of our worship. Let me ask you, did you bring the best of your worship into God's house today? Is this the best you can worship God? 
Because God demands our best and He's worthy of it. I think oftentimes what we do is we give God minimal service and minimal worship. Well, preacher, the service went too long today. It was over an hour. But you know, I never hear anybody complaining about movies that go two and a half hours. Have you? But God gets his hour. You see, the difference is our heart. It's where we are. No one asks Ole Miss not to go into overtime in a basketball or football game and says to them, we're not staying, we're leaving. But boy, if the preacher's over, we're out. Because God has had his time. Friends, where is our heart? Whether you're rich or poor, we're called to worship God the best we can through the Holy Spirit who is in us. Not only are we called to worship, we're called to grow through a relationship to Christ. We just finished a message series last year on being a prayer warrior through having a war room. It was encouraging me to see many of you come up to me and say, Brother Brian, we now have a war room or a place of war in our homes, in our jobs, in our trucks, out by the lake where we do battle with enemy because you know what, our family, our lives are more important than what we've been giving them. If we believe God is able. You know, if you're poor financially, you're also called to be a living witness for Jesus. And you're called to tithe. You see, tithing is a way that you prove God's faithfulness. At this time this morning, my father is here, and I'm going to ask my dad to come and share an illustration with you, which I believe you'll identify with. Dad? In, 19, <clears throat> in 1979, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1979, a man by the name of Dan, Don Rutledge worked for the uh, Home Mission Board, now the North American Mission Board, and he wrote a series of articles in their magazine on trusting God in rural Mississippi. He spent about three weeks with a family that lived just west of Brookhaven in a little place called Quinton. Their names were Bailey and Lavinia King. Bailey and Lavinia had lived in absolute poverty all their life. They raised 12 children. But the reason they lived in poverty is because they always gave whatever they had to anyone else who needed it worse than they did. Bill Cates, a music composer in Nashville, and I wrote a musical about their life. And I want to share with you this morning one of the scenes from that musical. It's a true story, and it goes something like this. It was a hot day in southern Mississippi. Bailey was out working in the garden behind his shack, and as he pondered why that bean vine wrapped itself around the pole, he looked up and he saw coming in the distance a man carrying an enormous load on his back. The man got closer to his shack, and across from the shack, across the road, there was a stump, and the man stopped to rest on the stump. Bailey walked around the corner of the house. Hello there. Warm day, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir, it sure is. Well, where about you live at? Well, sir, I live the other side of the old Jackson plantation. Well, where about you headed? Uh, well, sir, I, I got to carry this produce down to Brown's Landing. Brown's Landing, that must be seven, eight miles from here. Yes, sir. Well, that's too big a load for a man to carry that distance. I uh, ain't got no choice, sir. I got too many mouths to feed. Bailey looked at the man. He said, well, what you need is a wagon. Oh, yes, sir, the man said. A wagon show would be nice. Well, I got a wagon. It's out behind the shack. Won't you go ahead and take it? Uh, no, no, sir. You, you, you can't give me your wagon. No, I'm not going to. I'm giving you the wagon, and there's a horse there. Hitch the horse up to the wagon and take it. Horse? You can't give me no horse. Folks think I stole it. Well, you can't pull a wagon without a horse. The man looked up at Bailey. Sir, you're giving me your horse and your wagon? That's right. Sir, I, 
I don't know what's to say. Nobody never gave me nothing before. Tears filled the man's eyes. Bailey reached down. He said, say, what did you say your name was? It, Sam, sir. Sam Jenkins. Well, Sam, if you ever meet a man that needs that horse and wagon worse than you do, you give it to him and we'll be even. Oh, yes, sir. I sure will. I sure will. And Bailey King and Sam Jenkins, a man he'd never met his entire life, walked arm in arm around the shack. They hitched up the horse to the wagon and loaded the produce in the back. Lavinia, Bailey's wife, said that as far as they could see Sam riding down the road, he was waving his arm, yelling, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, the interesting thing about the story of Bailey King giving his horse and wagon to a man named Sam Jenkins was that it was the only horse and wagon he ever owned. In fact, he and his wife, Lavinia, saved over 30 years to purchase it. Oh, to be like Jesus. To see as he sees. To love as he loves. To give as he gives. Poor. The second group that James discusses are those who are rich. And years ago, Billy Graham was visiting the Caribbean. And he was invited by one of the wealthiest men in the world to come to his home and eat. And so Dr. Graham and his wife did so. And while they were visiting, the man confessed, I am the most miserable man in the world. Out there is my yacht. I can go anywhere I want to. I have my private plane, my helicopters. I have everything I want to make my life happy. And yet, I'm miserable. If God has blessed you financially, and you are what we would call rich, God, too, calls you to be humble. You see, all rich men will one day become poor. All their possessions will be given to someone else. Their homes will not be theirs. All wealth is given by God. You can say, well, this is my car. This is my home because I've earned it. I worked for it. I bought it with my own money. But friend, what it's boiled down to is that God has allowed you to do that through his blessings in life. And ultimately, all those things are his. You see, the Bible says, The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of the Lord is the one thing that will stand forever. You look at verse 11, and James simply recounts Isaiah 40 in his own words. We are to be humble. We're also to trust. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.10 that the love of money, not money, I've often heard it misinterpreted and misquoted, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, what is, what is Paul talking about to Timothy? He's saying, Timothy, if you love money more than Jesus, that may very well lead you to be a greedy person. It may very well lead you to be a selfish person, a person who refuses to help others, a person who says, I don't have enough to tithe. I can't do that. It may even lead to an alienation of your loved ones. Believers today, we're not to trust in all the things that we have. We're not to trust in our CDs, our physical possessions, our bank accounts. We are to do exactly what the Israelites did in Exodus 27, who said some trust in horses, others in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That is whom we should trust in today as well. 
This past week, my wife and I had a mini disaster. When our bathroom had a pipe explosion and it decided to go on throughout much of our home. But if you ever notice people in natural disasters, whether they be fire, or tornadoes, hurricanes, or earthquakes, what have you, or floods, when they're interviewed, people would just, they'll be so distraught and they say, I've lost everything because they attach their self worth to their physical possessions. You see, that's what Satan does. Satan comes in and he says, you're only worth as much as what you have. And God says it's not what you have, but it's who you have that gives you worth and value. The enemy lies to us all the time. But it's interesting how wealth can cast an artificial light of security. Jesus himself tells a story in Luke chapter 16. A rich man, a man who lived outside his gates, a beggar named Lazarus. And when they died, Lazarus went to heaven and the rich man went to hell. Well, the rich man began questioning Abraham. Father Abraham, I am like this in my life. Please have Lazarus come to me. Notice he's still looking at Lazarus, not as an equal, but as someone who is below him. Have Lazarus come to me and just dip his finger in some water to cool my tongue. And, of course, the text tells us, Son, in your life you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. Now, because Lazarus was faithful, he has everything. But you who are not faithful have nothing. The man's wealth gave him an artificial light and hope of security. The final aspect and what God asks us and commands us to do is not simply to be humble and to trust, but to be obedient and to obey Him. It's interesting when you look at giving records that people who are deemed poor or in the middle class tend to give more than any other segment of society. That's especially true in the local church. One of the things I love about our state is that while Mississippi is one of the poorest states and some would say the poorest, do you know Mississippi is the most giving state in the nation per capita? Now, I don't want to go into all the reasons as to why it is true or why that is so, but I suggest one thing. If Mississippi is the most religious state in the nation, and that's what it's known as, if people in Mississippi are more sold out to Jesus than anyone or anything else, then just as New Testament Christians did, people in Mississippi want to be faithful to God and give back to God what is His. Is it any imagination whatsoever that liberals, people who don't love Jesus, want to come after people in Mississippi because we don't agree with their ideologies? No, it is not. Because if you stand for Jesus, God will bless you, but Satan will come after you. Oh, God has blessed us in this state. And yet Solomon understood where some rich men were. He says in Proverbs 18, 11, that a rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. He says, people think that wealth is all that matters, that these big homes their carriages, their horses, all of their concubines, the things they own, that's what matters most. But oh, God says it matters nothing. It is all a facade, a mirage. God calls those who have been blessed financially to understand, as James says, they are to glory in their humiliation because all that is yours, all that is mine, no matter who defines us or places us in what financial category or social category in this country or in this world, no matter what we have, everything is God's. And what God asks is that we be faithful in all matters. To whom much has been given, much is required. And there's verse 12. Verse 12 sums up 
the first 11 verses. Of course, we spoke about trials in verses 2 through 4 last week. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you go through trials of all kinds. I've heard someone say, well, I've never known the trial of struggling with wealth. Lord, would you help me with that? No, that's not what God does. But I've learned this in life, that a player on a team has to overcome adversity. And he or she must work very hard to overcome their adversary or their opposition. If not, their opposition will most likely overcome them. Because in a similar way, sin is seeking to destroy us. Do you remember back in Genesis where Cain and Abel bring their sacrifices before God? Well, God blesses Abel and rejects Cain's sacrifice because Abel brings his best. Cain brings his leftovers. And God says, Cain, you better be careful because sin is creeping at your door. Guess what Cain does? He says, I know it, Lord. He goes out and he kills his brother because of selfishness and a rejection of faithfulness to God. By the way, the same thing happens to you and I today. Same thing. We may not seek to kill people, but a refusal to give God our very best leads to giving God very little in our lives, which gives Satan the very inroad that he needs to tempt us and place us in circumstances that we're not ready nor able to handle without God. You see, friends, what God has called us to today, whether we're poor or rich or as we would say in America, the middle class, God has called us to be faithful to Him with all that we have, with our physical possessions, with our physical lives, with every breath that's in our body. We're to give Him glory and point people to Jesus. The mayor of New York from 1933 to 1945 was Fiorello H. LaGuardia. You may have heard of LaGuardia International Airport. Well, one night, LaGuardia, as he was mayor, went to a night court judge and he relieved him of his duty. And a lady was brought before him. And LaGuardia said, what is this woman accused of? And they told him. And he said, ma'am, can you tell me why did you steal this loaf of bread? And the woman said, well, sir, my daughter's husband just left her and her husband, just left her and her family, and she has no way of receiving money, and I myself have no way to make a living. And the, man looked at, the mayor looked at the shopkeeper and said, you've heard her story, what do you say? And he said, I don't care what her circumstances are, Your Honor. She must have an example made of her to show that stealing is wrong. Guardia sighed and said, I'm afraid you're right. And he looked at the woman and said, ma'am, he said, the cost is $10 or 10 days in jail. Which will it be? At that, the woman began weeping, but even before LaGuardia had said the words, he reached into his pocket and he took out a $10 bill and he held it up and he put it in his hat. And he said these words, Here's the $10 fine which I now remit. And furthermore, I am fining everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendants. You see, even though this woman was guilty, the judge had mercy upon her life. That's where we are as people. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've had people in life say to me, Pastor, I've done too much. God can't love me. Pastor, I'm beyond salvation. Pastor, I'm too far gone. I'm too much in debt. Friend, God wants you to hear these words today. No matter what your debt may be, no matter its depth, no matter its depravity, the Bible says that Jesus died for all.
for you and for me. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that cool how Romans 2, 11 says, Romans 2, uh, Romans 2, 10 and 11 says, God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care our financial status, our social status. God simply cares that we are His children made in His image and He wants us to come home and have a relationship with Him. But friend, that relationship can only begin when we understand that there is something that is separating us from that relationship with our Father. And it's sin. Oh, but Jesus died and He bled. And He gave His life that we might have sin. Praise God on the third day. God raised Jesus to life. Took him, out of, take, took him out of the tomb. And when Jesus stepped out, death was conquered. And humanity could see life through the living breath of Jesus, its Savior and its Lord. Would you give your life to Him today, friend? Because He gave His for you and for me. No matter what we've done. No matter where we think we are, oh, God wants so much more and He sees so much more than anything we can possibly fathom. If you've never given your life to Jesus, would you give your life to Jesus today? By saying, Lord God, I know that I've sinned in my own life. Lord, I'm asking forgiveness of that sin. I want Jesus to come in my life, take control of everything. I want to live for you. Lord, I believe you died on the cross for my sin and that God did raise you victoriously to life. Friend, if you've never been saved in your life or you're doubting that decision or that salvation, today is the day that God wants you to allow Him to make it right. Would you do that? Folks, this altar is open to you. It's open to me. It's a place where we simply come and talk to the Lord. Many of you are going through difficult times. Some of you know others who are going through difficult times. Some of you just want to come and may want to come and praise God for what He's doing, what He continues to do. We serve an awesome God who is faithful in all matters. Do you remember what God did for you five years ago, ten years ago, five days ago? Because He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Would you praise His name today? If you've been visiting friendship for a while, but God is leading you today to unite with us, would you come and let's serve God together? Whatever God is leading you to do this morning, I challenge you to do it. Be faithful. Don't look at your physical or financial situation. But look at Jesus. And may it be said when you and I pass away one day that what we were rich in was Jesus Christ. May that be our defining moment and who defines us. Would you bow your heads and let's pray this morning. Father God, for these moments to come, we give them to you. Your spirit is here. God, he's led us all week to this time. May we be faithful and respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand this morning?